So basically, I change the title of the talk a little bit as I start putting things together, and that usually happens when I, when I talk. So basically, I'm going to concentrate basically on the area of amino acid uh, metabolism and digestion. And uh, I'll explain as the talk develops, I'll explain why I decided to do uh, uh, work on this topic. And the main reason is because I have work on it and I have data on it. Um, it comes to that, be that simple. Here's a little bit of, of the agenda or the outline that we'll have for today. So uh, we'll talk a little bit very briefly on, on immune activation. Uh, we're going to spend some time basically on looking at kinetics and changes in plasma amino acid concentration and trying to derive amino acid balances from there. Uh, then we go and we're going to dive uh, uh, into amino acid digestibility and then what happens uh, when animals are sick and we actually use a salmonella infection challenge um, in order to, uh, uh, to achieve this. And then we have um, talk a little bit, uh, re-emphasize some of what Dr. Farris talked about in terms of the fate of undigested uh, crude protein and amino acids and what are the consequences and then a little re-emphasis over there. And then we have some conclusions, and then uh, Dr. Farris and Dr. Boyd will be more than happy to answer all the questions that you guys may have. So if we look at basically uh, the classical um, pattern is that we have, uh, we've been using LPS or lipopolysaccharide for many years to stimulate the immune system. It's a quick way to do it. It's a short-living stimulation, but it can give us some pretty interesting information. Um, pretty much the, the story goes that, you know, LPS is a component of the, uh, of the um, wall of um, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it activates primarily macrophages. They release uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines, and this is produced a cascade of events that simulates an acute uh, disease model. And then uh, a lot of work has been worked on uh, skeletal muscle proteolysis and protein synthesis, and also some work has done uh, in, the, uh, in the case of acute phase proteins. So if we start, and I'm going to give you some kind of um, historic uh, perspective. Uh, if we look at here, um, what is basically animals that were challenged with, with PERS, and then we look at the, uh, what is their protein accretion potential even seven or 14 days after inoculation, we see that there is a significant and drastic reduction in protein accretion. There's differences in feed intake, but even if you correct for feed intake, using feed intake as a covariant, you still will end up with a significant reduction in protein accretion meaning that the reduction in feed intake does not account entirely or does not explain entirely the reduction um, in feed intake. In terms of protein synthesis, and these are data from uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Renan Orellana, and we're looking at protein synthesis here in two primary muscles, the longissimus dorsi, which is primarily a white um, um, muscle fiber type, and then the gastrocnemius is primarily a red um, muscle uh, fiber type. And then we're looking here in animals that are challenged or are uh, stimulated with LPS, we have significant reduction in terms of protein synthesis. So we start putting these things together, and it looks like, you know, part of what we get this reduction when animals are sick is, is primarily because there is a physiologi physiological reduction in the capacity of these animals to actually synthesize protein. If we look at brief cartoon of basically you know, about the immune activation and what's the impact on metabolism. We get pathogens that are present all the times. Our classical view is that pathogens are actually in the environment and they're going to go and infect the pig. A lot of the times we're actually realizing that some of these potential pathogens actually do reside inside the animal, but they are not expressed or they're expressed in a place within the gastrointestinal tract where it doesn't cause a pathology. Um, however, if we look at the classical mode, these pathogens are primarily going to go and affect two major uh, uh, organ systems that we care about it, either the respiratory system or the gastrointestinal system. And in the end, they're going to cause inflammation. And they, the way that they cause this inflammation is primarily they go and then they associate uh, with macrophages, and these macrophages respond in one way, producing, they produce reactive um, oxygen species, which can in turn uh, cause inflammation and damage to the adjacent cells in, in their effort to actually uh, kill and get rid of these pathogens. Um, from these macrophages, and then for all those veterinarians in the audience, you know, guys, you know this better than I do, uh, once we have macrophages that are infected, they can uh, actually migrate to other tissues via the uh, um, lymphatic system. Um, the other thing that we talk about a lot is the cytokines that are secreted by these activated immune cells. The cytokines, first and foremost, have their effective on cells of the immune system in order to combat um, the infection of the animal. 
They also act on other tissues. An example is the central nervous system in, in cytokine releases actually causes somnolence in animals. In all of us, when we have uh, become sick, the last thing we want to do is be active in, in walking around. We just want to uh, lay down and sleep. Particularly, the cytokines are well known. This pathway has been studied uh, quite substantially. They have a direct effect on muscle. They also have a direct effect on liver. In terms of protein synthesis, cytokines will reduce skeletal muscle protein synthesis, and they will increase protein synthesis in the liver. So for many years, the thought has been that the muscle is actually degrading to feed amino acids, and to provide amino acids to the liver, which is synthesizing protein at a high rate, and particularly uh, those acute phase type proteins. And then we're going to go a little bit more in, into the details uh, of this specific pathway. Uh, the late Dr. Peter Ritz did a very nice theoretical exercise when he compared the amino acid profile of acute phase proteins um, produced by human uh, livers against the amino acid profile that you get in mixed uh, muscle uh, proteins. And when he found that, and then he ranked it over here, and then here are all the amino acids that, that he ranked out, and then he basically came out the conclusion that phenylalanine would be the most limited amino acid. And then for those of us that are uh, nutritionists in the audience, and for those of us that call ourselves swine nutritionists, the first amino acid, and sometimes the only amino acid that comes to mind is lysine. And lysine is way down here at the bottom. And then there's a, so we see that the, uh, the order of amino acids limitation or requirement, if you want to put it in that way, may be particularly shift. And I want to draw your attention. Phenylalanine is number one here. And then tyrosine is right here in position number five. And then I want you to keep this in mind, because if you go back to your biochemistry class, and I don't want to torture anybody, but phenylalanine is a direct precursor of tyrosine. And then there's a direct relationship between the concentration of phenylalanine in plasma with the concentration of tyrosine in plasma. Uh, basically, what this basically means, if these amino acids are deficient here and these amino acids are in excess here in order to fit the, uh, the liver, what happens with these amino acids that will be in excess here is they're going to be deaminated, and then the net result is going to be an increase in plasma, urea, and nitrogen. Um, this data I took from um, Dr. Doug Wavell when he was a grad student, and then he's partially, if not hugely responsible for me getting involved in this wonderful field. Uh, but I helped him with some of his studies, and then actually he measured here, these are um, the time and the time course of cytokine elevation after uh, administration of LPS. And then what we see is that we see that the elevation in cytokines precedes the elevation in plasma urea nitrogen, and this is normally what we observe when animals are sick. And then the hypothesis is that this is basically extra nitrogen that is being broken down from the muscle in order to feed the liver. Now, most of these studies, not to say 99.9% .9 of those studies, have actually been done in the facet state. And the reason for that is because the mechanics of conducting the studies are, are fairly, uh, fairly easy. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do, we wanted to say, first of all, what is the relationship in terms of the amino acid response and amino acid kinetics in the facet state versus the fed state or the postprandial um, uh, state? So we went ahead and did that. And then what we know is that when pigs are sick at the barn, they normally they reduce their feed intake. They don't completely suppress feed intake. And then if they completely suppress feed intake, then there's probably not much we can do about it because uh, they're probably getting close to die. Um, so what we did is uh, we wanted to cause an acute immune activation, uh, both in the, uh, in the facet state and compare that to the classical things that we know about the fed state. Uh, so we basically put some catheters in these animals, and indwelling catheters, both in the uh, jugular and the carotid, uh, the jugular vein and carotid artery. We let them recover from surgery. And then what we did is basically we put them on a meal pattern so they knew exactly when to eat. We fasted them for a period of time. We feed them, and we determined that two hours was enough for us to determine, detect a significant increase in plasma amino acids, which basically means that the animals have had enough time to digest and absorb those amino acids that are provided uh, dietarily. And then we did continuous blood samples for 24 hours. Uh, if we look at here, basically here the animals would be uh, uh, fasted. This would be our control. We feed the pigs here, and about two hours later, we see that the, uh, um, the blood urea nitrogen has not changed a little bit. 
we see it here a slight increase, which is basically the excess of amino acids because all the diets that we fed, no matter how well we try to balance, they're always unbalanced um, um, for amino acids. Um, at this point, we either give saline to the animals or we give LPS. When we give LPS, we got the classical response that has been reported in the literature um, uh, for uh, many years and for different species. So the increase in blood urea nitrogen in the postprandial um, uh, phase seems to be fairly similar to what you get um, in the fasted state. And then just for Dr. Boyd, we, got all, we did all the statistics, so we're okay. Um, so this, all these levels here of, of um, blood urea nitrogen, they're all significantly higher compared to the control animals. Um, if we start looking at plasma changes in phenylalanine, and then I hope you appreciate why I'm concentrating phenylalanine at the end. Uh, what we have here, we have here the fasted pig. We feed this pig, and then two hours later, we can detect a significant increase in plasma levels of phenylalanine. If we provide saline to these animals, well, phenylalanine continue to rise, and then it slowly starts to come down as digestion um, uh, progresses and absorption of phenylalanine takes place. And then it turns to uh, kind of stabilizes over here because these animals are not uh, eating anymore. Um, and then all these points are significantly different um, from the fasting control. If we do this with LPS, what we got is we got a considerably different response here. On the fed animals, on the saline animals, we see a phenylalanine increases and basically decreases. What we see in the LPS uh, 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 pigs is basically we saw a rapid decline in LPS followed by a huge increase in plasma phenylalanine concentration. And then basically we can see here that we have a mismatch of the concentrations of phenylalanine in the, in the plasma of these animals. Now, if we compare, this would be plasma phenylalanine over here, and this would be the graph of blood urea nitrogen. What appears to coincide is that the excess in phenylalanine in blood coincides with the excess of the increase in blood urea nitrogen that we see in animals. This is particularly true for a lot of different amino acids, so we can start to say fairly uh, confidently that is the excess of circulating amino acids that are not being used for metabolic purposes and they are being not coming, they're not derived from the diet, so they are derived from endogenous sources. But these excess of amino acids are actually leading to this increase in blood urea nitrogen. And then we see the division about here, which is about five or six hours after we treat the animals with LPS, when we see basically the animals shifting from a lower concentration to a higher concentration of phenylalanine, and that's when we see the increase in blood urea nitrogen. Uh, if we look at other amino acids, um, here's slicing, uh, for example, and you guys can see the patterns, you know, lower at the beginning and then it's higher at the end. Uh, here's uh, methionine, uh, again, lower at the beginning, higher at the end. Uh, here's threonine. Uh, pretty low at the beginning and just about not different afterwards. And I have to show you leucine, uh, otherwise my uh, postdoctoral mentor will not be happy with me. And leucine is one of those that basically almost remains negative throughout the entire uh, period of LPS treatment, along with valine and isoleucine. So the branch chain amino acid seems to take a really hard beat on their concentrations. So if we go back, let's go back again um, to um, the plasma concentration levels of phenylalanine, and let's focus on this um, um, area over here, which is our, our the first five hours post-LPS um, uh, treatment. Uh, what we can do is basically we can draw the area under the curve um, for LPS, and we can calculate that, and we can do the same thing for the control. We can measure these two areas, and if we do that, we get these numbers, and then what's important here is basically that when we calculate the area under the curve, the animals that are treated with LPS basically have a 45% reduction in the area under the curve of phenylalanine. So the reduction in circulating levels of phenylalanine, it's actually quite dramatic. And we did this basically for all amino acids in, uh, in all different um, stages. And then we did a lot of work uh, measuring the area under the curve. For example, here we have isoleucine. And then so basically we have for isoleucine, as I was telling you, isoleucine were one of those amino acids that was lower uh, during the entire time, and basically we call these the animals to be on a negative balance, and that should basically mean their concentrations are lower compared to the um, saline-treated animals. We have other amino acids, such as alanine, and alanine was positive during the entire period of the, uh, of the administration of LPS and blood sampling, 
And then we have some other amino acids like methionine. I also show uh, phenylalanine. For a period of time, they are negative, and then for a period of time, they're positive. So we went on and basically determined where these shifts uh, from negative to positive or positive from negative took place, and then we calculate and, and quantify the area under the curve uh, for both um, uh, groups of pigs. And then we basically run the statistics, and then basically we can come here and determine uh, that when the pigs are in the, uh, in the negative relationship for phenylalanine, for example, this negative uh, uh, area is actually significant. When they go on a positive side, it's also a significant increase in phenylalanine. And then for some other amino acids, such as citrulline, uh, there is no difference, uh, which is it's kind of puzzling because you will think that with the uh, urea cycle running at such a high speed and producing so much uh, urea, you will probably expect you know, citrulline and ornithine uh, to be elevated in plasma, but it wasn't, uh, that was not the case. So from there on, and then having these areas under the curves calculated, then we basically decided that with that information, we could actually use them to try to estimate uh, what was the plasma amino acid balance. And then again, this is not a tracer kinetic type of approach, but it was basically used in two different treatments. Uh, so basically, we calculate the area under the curve for each amino acid. Uh, for both the saline and the LPS uh, treaty groups. And then we find a publication uh, back from 1970 that basically allowed to uh, provide us a correction factor in order to move um, uh, the area uh, from plasma in kilograms per body weight to a unit um, uh, micromoles per kilogram um, per mole. So with that information, we came up with this equation, which basically it's the difference between the area under the curve uh, for both treatments, we apply our correction factor, and we get our time uh, adjusted as well. And this will basically give us a good approximation or a good estimate as the balance of amino acids when the animals are sick. Here are the amino acids that were negative, and then when we're talking about negative, for example, in this case, it's basically when the concentration in plasma was always lower compared to the saline control ones. And we can see different amino acids going to different levels of, um, of a balance that are negative, glutamine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, ornithine, and tryptophan actually came out to be negative during the entire 24-hour uh, blood collection period. Uh, we can do the, do the same thing for those amino acids uh, that basically exhibit a positive amino acid balance, and here's an example of alanine, uh, alanine, so we're talking about that difference between the LPS treated and the saline animal, animals. And we have here taurine and alanine were positive during uh, the entire period. And then we have different amino acids that have different uh, periods of positive control. And then there was a huge um, error associated with glutamine and citrulline, so we couldn't determine any significantly difference from a balance or a theoretical balance of zero. So to summarize some of what we saw, we know, that, you know, we know what the uh, acute activation of the immune system does. Uh, using a model like LPS. It basically uh, induces changes in amino acids and induces an increase in plasma, urea, and nitrogen. Uh, and this happens both in the fasted as well as in the postprandial effect. And then the question is basically here, do we have a reduction in the digestion or absorption of these dietary amino acids? We know and we're under the assumption and presumption that, that, that there is elevated catabolism because of the increased level of blood urea nitrogen present in these animals. But then very little is known about the digestion and absorption of animals uh, uh, when they're sick. And when we basically, when we altered the amino acid balance and we, when we measured, uh, lysine, yes, lysine was the most negative one. Alanine was the most positive one. But then is the fact that lysine is, was the most negative one, does that mean that lysine is the most limiting? amino acid when animals are experiencing immune activation. After all, the, from the numbers, the, from the theoretical numbers from Dr. Peter Ritz, it will say that the animals will not need that much lysine when they're actually sick. So here's what I want to bring back, you know, phenylalanine to tyrosine. And again, I apologize for bringing you back once again uh, to uh, your introductory class of biochemistry. But, you know, this is a fairly simple uh, conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine by phenylalanine um, hydroxylase. Uh, we got two papers here. One is in preterm infants, which are under a lot of um, stress and, and, and um, stressful conditions. 
And here, basically, we have a pretty linear relationship between the concentrations of plasma phenylalanine and plasma tyrosine. The, the, the uh, conclusion from this paper um, by uh, Danny Beer and co-workers was basically that preterm infants are not tyrosine deficient, and they have enough phenylalanine hydroxylase um, ability uh, to produce all the, the tyrosine that they need. Here is some data from, uh, uh, I believe this is from uh, Ron Ball and co-workers. This is also adult humans. And basically, we can see that as uh, phenylalanine concentration or phenylalanine intake increases, there is a plasma concentration increase uh, in tyrosine. So we got evidence from both um, preterm infants as well as adults that there is a pretty much linear relationship between phenylalanine and tyrosine in plasma. So here is a plasma concentration of tyrosine during our 24-hour collection. And basically, you can see how tyrosine here drops down, and it pretty much stays below the entire time compared to the saline-treated animals. And then we have, this would be the significant effect of feeding time. So when we feed, tyrosine goes up. And then in the LPS-treated animals, we don't get that increase uh, in, ty in tyrosine. So the question is still is, is it digestion, is it absorption, or is it something else? Now, what becomes um, a pretty interesting, at least for me, uh, and you guys may, may are welcome to disagree, is when we put uh, phenylalanine next to tyrosine side by side, and we start looking at this area of surplus of phenylalanine here, which is basically after our five, hour six, we have a plasma surplus of phenylalanine, yet when we come to tyrosine, tyrosine is still largely deficient. So basically, this surplus of phenylalanine in blood is not being converted to tyrosine because what you will have expected if you have um, unmodified or uncompromised um, um, phenylalanine to tyrosine conversion, you basically you would expect that as phenylalanine start to increase in plasma, we would expect to see a corresponding increase in tyrosine in plasma. And this is actually not the case. So one of the things that we need to start thinking about it is what is the limitation, at least in amino acids, what is the limitation order of amino acids that we need to be evaluating? And the other thing that, um, that we need to think about it is basically that we, we divide amino acids in essential, conditional, and non-essential. And we always need to think about that this arbitrarily uh, um, classification has been made from the point of view of feeding dietarily essential, non-essential, or uh, conditionally essential amino acids to animals that are healthy. If we go back to the classical definition of W.C. Rose of, of what is a, um, an essential amino acid, you have it over there. I'm sure you have read it and have read about it. And we all know it about it. It's basically an amino acid that needs to be produced endogenously. And in order to produce that amino acid, there is enough uh, nutrients available uh, to produce that amino acid. So it's plausible to hypothesize that tyrosine may likely be a dietary essential amino acid under the conditions, at least of the study that we were running on, because although there was plenty of tyrosine in the diet, and although there was plenty of phenylalanine present in plasma, there was no either digestion or absorption of tyrosine from the diet, or there was inability or, or lower capacity of the animals to actually convert phenylalanine to tyrosine. For the purposes of protein synthesis, all the amino acids are equally essential. At that point, once basically, once we pass the level of absorption and digestion, the, the categorization of essential and non-essential, it's not applicable. At that point, all amino acids become essential because when you are synthesizing a protein and you have your mRNA template and you start having and calling those tRNAs one by one, if you call an, an, an amino acid or a charged tRNA, I don't care which amino acid it is. It could be lysine, methionine, tyrosine, alanine, or phenylalanine. It doesn't matter. If that tRNA is not properly charged in the quantity that needs to be there, the growing peptide change will be broken down, the ribosome disassembles, and then that, that protein will never get synthesized and you'll never get the effect that you have. So the essentiality for, for protein synthesis is equal for all the amino acids. And we really need to think about what is the most limited amino acid and the second most limited amino acid if we started to think in the classical terms of nutrition when our animals are sick. And we probably need to rethink, seriously rethink, 
about the order of the limitation of amino acids that are needed for metabolic purposes when animals are sick. So to me it has been uh, very interesting that a lot of the work that is actually in the literature has concentrated on this part over here, which we have already passed the gut, the absor digestion, absorption, you know, first passive met metabolism taken by the liver. And there's a lot of studies in this area over here. There is a handful of studies that actually look at the liver. And then there's pretty much no studies that have looked at actually what the, what's the rate of digestion or absorption. And then for those of you that were in the session here before when Dr. Berkey was talking about it, he was also referring to this area over here. So we say, well, let's go back and then look at digestibility and find out why are people not measuring amino acid digestibility when animals are sick? So we actually embark and start doing the studies, and then we find out the hard way why people are not doing that. And it's because it's pretty complicated. Um, so when it comes to amino acid digestibility, there's two things that we come to about, think about as to the factors that alter them. There's some factors that are endogenous and some factors that are uh, exogenous. And then from these exogenous factors, the one that we want to concentrate is the presence of pathogens or the presence of disease. And for our, particularly, uh, for our particular studies, uh, we basically use the same one as salmonella challenge in pigs. Yes, salmonella is not a very prevalent pathogen in the swine industry. I understand that. Uh, it may be a foodborne pathogen. Yes, I understand that. We have a lot of problems with salmonella, mainly when we uh, move the pigs from the farm to the processing plant, and then we have increasing salmonella shedding during the transport, probably associated because of the stress. Um, but nonetheless, for our purposes, um, salmonella challenge became a model that was predictable and repeatable, and that's something that we were looking for. Uh, so we actually um, got a salmonella make it uh, resistant to two um, antibiotics that so we could detect it, and we did intranasal inoculation. And the way we did this is we have one room, basically, where we inoculate the animals with, um, with sterile um, um, solution. And to these animals, we fed them either a nitrogen-free diet or a regular corn soybean meal-based diet. And then we have a salmonella-infected uh, room, and the dietary treatments are the same, a nitrogen-free diet or a control diet. And we actually we euthanized the animals 20, 24 and 72 hours after oral inoculation, but I'm only going to show you um, uh, results from 24 hours. Um, the first thing that I wanted to show you is I want to show you apparent Ileal digestibility, and then I'll show you standardized, and then there's something interesting here. Uh, what we see basically over here, we have the amino acids here. Uh, in the white bar are the uh, control animals or the non-infected animals, and in the red bar we have the salmonella animals. There's a lot of variation. There's a lot of p-values over here, but if you allow me to basically put a, put a star on anything, there will be 0.15 or less. Uh, basically, you come up that just about every single amino acid is significantly lower in terms of their uh, digestibility coefficient compared to the um, uninfected animals. Okay, when we look at the basal endogenous losses, and the definition of the basal endogenous losses is basically what you get is the amount of amino acids that you get when you feed a nitrogen-free diet. When your animals are sick, can we call those basal or they're not basal? I don't know. That's a point of discussion. It's a very interesting academic um, discussion, but for this purpose, we're going to stick to the definition that says if we feed a nitrogen-free diet, the amount of amino acids present at the ileum, it's basically what are called the basal endogenous nitrogen losses. And here we have a true p-value of 0.05, Dr. Boyd, for you. And then what we see basically here, we see a drastic, significant, and at this point, basically, the significant becomes, in my mind, not significant. It's a drastic increase of several fold two, three, five, in some cases, even tenfold increase in the amount of uh, endogenous um, nitrogen losses. So what we used to formulate is we use standardized cellular digestibilities. And everybody knows that, and everybody that formulates knows that, and nobody dares to use apparent ileal digestibilities, and you should not be using it. But the thing is, the definition or the difference between apparent and standardized is you take, apparent is the only digestibility we can measure, then we measure endogenous nitrogen losses, and we use those losses to correct the apparent digestibility in order to get standardized digestibility. Now, what do you think would happen when the, the endogenous losses, we can look at here glycine, it's 10, about 11-fold difference. 
Basically, the correction factor that will be applied to the apparent ileal digestibility, it's so big that in most of these cases, you see most of these amino acids, if not all of them, they're all significantly lower. But when we put them in terms of standardized ileal digestibility, and we use the endogenous basal losses for each group, we actually end up with significantly higher digestibility coefficients for all of the amino acids. They're either they're not different or they're significantly higher. And then now you tell me how much sense does it make to say or to conclude that a sick pig has a greater digestibility capacity compared to an animal that is healthy. So it's one of those situations where we have found that, that the, where the standardized approach may not be applicable um, 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 in order to measure basically what's the, the true capacity of the animal. So I'll show you data for 24 hours, and then we also have data at 72 hours. And what we see at 72 hours is the, um, the changes uh, thing to uh, um, normalize itself. So we did another study, and in this case, instead of using with the uh, comparative slaughter approach, we wanted to use ileal cannulated pigs. This was a heck of a lot easier said than done because you've got to do surgery, you've got to treat these animals with antibiotics, but again, at the end you want to make sure that they are antibiotic free. They have all the antibiotic out of their system, so when you infect them with salmonella, they become sick. Again, that was a heck of a lot easier to say than done, and then it took us um, several tries. Um, but we did that, and then we actually cannulated these pigs. We let them recover. Uh, we infected them with salmonella, and basically we collected digesta for eight hours, for periods of eight hours, for a total of 72 consecutive hours. And the design was the same. We have room, basically we have uh, um, animals that were the uh, uh, control animals uninfected, consuming a nitrogen-free and a standard diet. And then we have our salmonella challenge group, both with nitrogen-free and a control diet. And what I'm gonna show you here is the open bars, the open circles are the apparent ileal digestibility, the, uh, uh, the dark, the black circles are the standardized ileal digestibility, and at the bottom, which will go here with the right-hand uh, y-axis, are the endogenous nitrogen losses, and then you have here uh, the period post inoculation. In this case, uh, we got tyrosine here, and then what we see is that we inoculate the animals at this point here at time zero, and we get a drastic reduction in amino acid digestibility, and that digestibility slowly starts to recover at the end of uh, 72 hours. Uh, we have pretty much restore or recovery of these animals. Uh, in the case of endogenous nitrogen losses, we see a sharp increase um, when we have uh, the uh, infection with salmonella. The other thing that I want you to notice here is I don't have bars or stars over each one of the points. And the other thing that I want to point out here is the size of the error bars that are huge. And we have a lot of animals, but we have a lot of variation. It's one of the challenges also that Dr. Berkey in the previous session was um, mentioning about. So that's um, tyrosine. Uh, here is lysine, and we can see pretty much the same pattern, a reduction in amino acid and recovery, and increase in endogenous nitrogen losses. And here is uh, uh, tyrosine. So going back to the tyrosine uh, story, we have a double whammy because we have reduced digestibility, likely reduced absorption, and then we have un the inability of the animals to use phenylalanine as a source of tyrosine. If we look at the overall digestibility, if I average all the amino acids, this is basically how they will look out. A reduction and then recovery, endogenous nitrogen losses will go up, and then it will start to normalize. Um, if we look at here, basically this will be the dry matter content of the digesta. You can see how the dry matter content goes down as the animals start to become infected and develop diarrhea. Uh, what it was interesting um, for us, and then um, basically we found this relationship between <coughs> excuse me, endogenous amino acid losses and the amount of dry matter present in the digesta. For practical purposes, we can think about that animals, they have loose stools, they're probably not digesting well, they're not absorbing well, and on top of that, they may be uh, 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 excreting uh, more endogenous nitrogen losses. So to summarize this, we have lower perineal digestibility that is associated with higher endogenous losses. So the animal is able to um, digest less amino acids and actually secreting more amino acids into the lumen of the, uh, of the gut. There's a higher demand for nutrients uh, and energy because of this. 
And then, so what we need to do is I need, we need to provide highly uh, digestible um, dietary proteins. And then I'll skip all of this in the sake of time. And then, uh, let me go back here. Just to reemphasize here, uh, we have two different treatments here in terms of um, protein and the user not of a protease, which in this case is not that relevant. Uh, two different kinds or two different types of diets with different levels of digestibility. So basically, you end up with different levels of ammonia in the cecum. If you increase the digestibility of the diet, you're going to end up with lower ammonia, and this lower ammonia and results in lower levels of pH in the cecum as well as in the ileum. This less fermentation of protein actually translates into an increase uh, in the presence of lactobacilli and a reduction in the presence of potentially pathogenic microorganisms like E. coli. And this is simply because we're uh, changing the environment in the gut. So to summarize, basically, we know that there is uh, alterations in terms of digestion, absorption, and metabolism of amino acids. Uh, we also know that um, undigested proteins have a tremendous effect, not only on the, uh, the bacterial species that are being produced, but also on the uh, population of uh, microbes uh, that will result from there. And at this point, basically, what we can do is we need to make sure that if we have animals that are under some sort of um, gut health challenge, is make sure that we provide them with ingredients that are highly digestible, at least in terms of uh, protein uh, and amino acids.